All right, of course, Jonah is a very famous uh, book of the Bible, very famous story. This is something that's uh, taught very often times to little children because, you know, the story of a man getting swallowed up by a whale for three days and three nights just seems to be a, a pretty cool story. But um, I think this is very timely. There's a lot of things going on recently where um, a lot of people are focusing on watching what's going on in other parts of the country with the hurricanes, right? We had Hurricane Harvey that hit Texas, Hurricane Irma's hitting Florida, and um, there's a few things I want to talk about, and, and really the, the point of my sermon this morning, what I'm going to be preaching on is weathering storms, weathering storms in your life. You say, well, we don't live on the coast, I know, but it doesn't mean you don't have storms. Now, there's a lot to learn a lot of um, spiritual applications we can make even in real life, you know, physical world examples and things that happen in this lifetime, um, especially with big disasters. One of the first things I'll be looking at here is just storm prevention in your life. And one of the things that we see is that God is fully capable and oftentimes will bring storms into people's lives. That was the exact scenario with Jonah. This storm that these people faced out on the sea when, when Jonah was running from God is not something that would have just occurred. It was, a, it was a, a severe storm and it was tempestuous and it was literally working against them because of Jonah. Jonah brought that storm not only on himself, but on everybody else that was in the boat with him. Now, God uses natural disasters and things like this to bring his judgment also upon countries on various places now i don't know if god is judging america right now but if he is it's completely just and i could think of a million reasons why god might want to judge you know the united states I, I, and i'm surprised it's not even worse which makes me just wonder if this even is a judgment of god but we see these things happening and there's a lot that we can learn from them. So let's look back here again at this, at this story in Jonah 1. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a little bit verse by verse, and we're going to point out a few points here. Uh, verse number 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. So God's commanding Jonah, hey, go preach to Nineveh. Nineveh is a wicked city, and you need to go and warn them and preach a warning from me. And that's God sending Jonah to go do work for him. Verse 3 says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, this is just silly in and of itself. I mean, trying to run away from God. Obviously, you can't run away from God. But this is the mentality that we fall into sometimes. We have a tendency to think that, oh, God's not going to see this, or I'm going to get away with this or that, you know, you might be, have some, some secret sin and, and you just kind of think that you're getting away with something. You can't get away from God. God sees everything. God knows everything. And it's, it's foolishness. And you're just going to be spinning your wheels if you try to go the opposite direction of what God wants you to do. It's just going to bring a lot of problems in your life. So this is what Jonah does. Verse 3 says, you know, he rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went the opposite direction. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He said he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. So where is this wind coming from? It's coming from God. It's coming from the Lord. The Lord sent out a great wind, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. A tempest is just a storm, but it's saying this is a mighty tempest. There's this great, huge storm caused by God, caused by this great wind that God sent forth. It says, so that the ship was like to be broken. The storm was so powerful. It, it had the capability of just completely breaking the ship and just tearing it up. You know, probably because the waves are so big, the winds are so strong that this vessel that they're in, this ship is not going to be able to stand it. And these people are experienced seamen. They're, 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 you know, he went and, and hired them. Basically, he bought a ticket to get on their boat. They're used to this, but when they see this great storm, they're getting really scared and really freaked out. So this isn't just your average person who's not used to going on boats, you know, experiencing a storm and getting scared. These are people who have been through all kinds of storms. 
And this one is really bad because God is bringing this against Jonah for, for disobeying him. Verse number five says, then the mariners were afraid. The mariners are the people who, who were manning the ship and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Now, this, this event of Jonah just going to sleep in the boat, I think there's two applications we made here. One of them, this is, as is the entire book of Jonah, is, is very prophetical of Jesus Christ. Now we see in the New Testament, and we're going to get to that passage near the end of the sermon where Jesus Christ is asleep in the boat when there's a big storm going on. And I think this is just a foreshadowing of that event, just giving us one more indication of, of how much um, of the prophecy that Jonah makes here. Because in chapter 2, once he's in the whale's belly, of course, it goes uh, back and forth between describing Jonah and whale's belly and then a soul being in hell which, of course, prophesies Jesus Christ being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, um, as, as he referenced to Jonah in the book of Matthew. So, um, but also, besides that apparent reference, I think it's definitely doing that. It's also showing, I believe, Jonah's lack of fear of the Lord. Because you know, all these people, they're afraid and they're praying unto their gods. Jonah knows he's not right with God. And there's all this storm coming, yet he's still asleep. He's not worried. Now, Jonah ought to have been worried. Jonah ought to have been worried about God punishing him before he ever even got into the ship. He ought to have had a proper fear of the Lord. That said, when God says to do something, I'm going to go and do it. But Jonah was lacking in this area, which is why he went to begin with, so much so that he was even able to fall asleep while all this, this turmoil is going on. He lacked a proper fear of the Lord. Now, and he ended up still having to go through a lot more than even just this storm because after he was cast overboard, of course, he's three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And that's real easy to read. And that sounds almost fun, especially if you're a youngster, you're a kid. You think, oh, man, that would be cool. Do you see these cartoons that they make of a guy on a little raft inside a whale's belly? I'll tell you what, I guarantee you it was not that cool or pleasant for Jonah inside of the belly of a beast. I mean, inside the belly of an animal, you're going to have digestive juices. You're going to have, you know, complete pitch blackness. You're not going to have a light or a torch to be lighting up your way like they want to show you in the cartoons. It's not like that at all. It's going to be completely miserable. You're going to be moving around. I mean, all the motion and being knocked around and stuff, not a good place to be at all. You probably barely kept alive by being inside of the, of the whale's be belly. That taught him the fear of the Lord, going through that experience and then being vomited up because once that happened, he said, okay, God, I'll go to Nineveh because <laughs> God told him to do the same exact thing that he had told him to do before. He's like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And, you know, with rebellious children, that's, that's what needs to happen sometimes. So one of the things we need to learn for storm prevention in your life, God's capable of bringing all kinds of really bad storms into your life. And the way to prevent that from happening is just doing what God tells you to do. Now, that's not always going to prevent all storms from coming, but it's definitely going to prevent the ones that God's going to bring your way. Because not everything is your fault. There's storms that happen in your life. There's, there's serious problems and difficulties and challenges that you face that actually have nothing to do with you. It may be you're keeping company with a Jonah and you don't even know it. That's a possibility. Or there's other reasons involved too. You know, Satan's going to be attacking people. The Bible teaches us and warns us that, yea, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That, that if we are doing what's right, we need to be aware of that because these storms, the storms arise for many reasons. But the last thing you want to do is have to go through something that difficult as a result of your own sin, as a result of you not listening to the Lord. Look at verse number 11 here. The Bible says in Jonah 1, then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea raw and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Jonah had, he knew exactly what was going on. 
He didn't have any doubt in his mind that it's completely because of me and all you got to do is just throw me overboard and you'll be just fine. Verse 13, the guys didn't want to do that. I mean, the, the men he's traveling with, they're like, we're not going to throw you overboard. You know, like, okay, it's your fault, but we're going to get you to the shore. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not for the sea rot and was tempestuous against them. You, can't, you cannot struggle against God. If God wants this to be, then it doesn't matter how hard they're working. So they, they couldn't do it. Verse number 14, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So basically they're throwing up their hands and just saying, God, you're the one that's doing this. and This is the way that you want it to be. You know, don't blame us. Don't, don't, don't hold us responsible for innocent blood. I mean, he told us that you, you know, you're going against him and that it's his fault and that we need to throw him into the sea, God. So just, you know, don't hold us responsible for us throwing him into the sea is what they're saying. Like, we're, let's just hold, you know, hold us guiltless. It's not our fault. And then in verse 15, it says, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea and the sea ceased from her raging. And these things are, are amazing. I love these miracles. And again, it's, one, it's just one sentence. Real easy to read over this stuff, but imagine just being in the worst storm. Problem gets fixed, storm stops. Raging stops. All of a sudden, things get real calm. Right? I mean, that, wasn't, that made a big enough impact in these guys' lives. I mean, they feared, and they're like, they start put, doing sacrifices and making vows unto God and just saying, wow, you know, the power of God. That's amazing. Now, many storms in our life, as I was mentioning, could be avoided if we would just submit ourselves to the will of God. There's so many areas of our life that, that we end up bringing problems upon ourselves, bringing drama into our own lives because we are disobedient, because we are not listening, because we hear what God tells us, but then we decide to go off and do the exact opposite, which is what Jonah did in this story. He heard God's will. He knew what God wanted him to do. And he deliberately said, no, I'm not going to do that. Sin will bring storms into your life. Drunkenness is going to bring storms into your life. You know God tells you not to be a drunk. But people hear that and what do they do? They want to go out and get drunk anyways. They want to go out and use drugs. It makes them feel good. You're not going to be feeling that good when the storm comes. Fornication, adultery is going to bring storms into your life. It's going to bring all kinds of drama. It's going to bring all kinds of problems. God said not to do it. Of course, it's going to bring problems into your life. And you're going to bring even more problems into your life if you're born again. See, sin inherently has its own problems. But when you're a child of God, when God is your father up in heaven, and you hear what he says and you directly disobey anyways, well, you better believe, yeah, you're going to get the, the inherent uh, repercussions of your sin, but God's going to lay a lot more on top of that. There's going to be way more coming down upon you as a result of your own sin. I'll give you a personal example from my own life. I was saved when I was 20 years old. I called on the name of the Lord, got saved. Amen. That's how everybody gets saved. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and you get saved. A couple years after that, I was, I was trying to flee from a, a life of, of drunkenness and just, just getting nothing done. I knew it was wrong, so I, did, so I decided to move out to Arizona. It's one of the reasons, uh, multiple reasons to move out here. But not very long after moving out here, old ways die hard, and it was... It was didn't know anyone out here, so what do I do? Go right back to the thing that I was used to. Right back to, you know, in a matter of a few weeks. And just within a few weeks, boom, DUI. Now, back then, first time problem, you know, no problems with the law, no other things, no aggravating circumstances, just a regular thing, right? Should have been real simple. Short suspension, you know, they do a, a weekend in jail or whatever in Tent City, and, and that's it. That's not what happened to me. <laughs> and I fully believe it's because I knew better and I'm a child of God and that God came down way harder on me 
than what normally would happen to just your average unbeliever. I got 10 days in tent city and my license not back for about almost two years. So it was a long ordeal. But I believe that's God trying to get through. That he's trying to get through to me. Oh, you left because you're trying to do the right thing. And then you go right back to your vomit. And you go right back to doing what's wrong. You know better than that. You shouldn't be doing that. And that's where the discipline comes from. That's a storm that I brought on myself. All that drama, all the headache, not being able to drive, not be, you know, paying all that money to... to get lawyers to help me answer their questions, you know, for all the, all the, get my license back and stuff. And it was just this, this whole hassle and ordeal could have completely been avoided if I would have just listened to God and did what's right. But there's so many, and that's just one example. That's my own personal example. Children, listen up. Disobeying your parents are going to bring storms into your life. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother, and then you need to listen to the laws that they have for you, and you need to be obedient unto them. Just as Jonah was disobedient to his father in heaven. We all, if you're saved, you got a father in heaven. But even as a young person, you've got a mother here or a father here. You need to listen to them and don't be disobedient to them. You do what they tell you to do. This isn't popular today, but wives disobeying your husband is going to bring the same storms. The Bible says that the husband is ahead. I mean, you read Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. There's, there's so many places in the Bible that talk about this, that you're to be obedient to your husband in everything. As the church is subject unto Jesus Christ, so should the wives be to their own husbands. And if you want to have a good marriage without self-brought-on storms on yourself, then this is what you need to be following. Follow the Word of God. Follow the will of God in your life. Harboring bitterness and resentment in your heart is also going to bring storms in your life. Because the Bible says that we're supposed to be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. When you have those arguments, when you have those disagreements, you can't hold on to that. You can't cling to that and remain bitter in your heart against whoever, against another loved one in your life, and just hold that within to cause more and more and more problems in your life. That's going to bring problems as well. You need to be forgiving. You need to be loving and um, be able to move past that and not hold on to things and be bitter and resenting. Not disciplining your own children will also bring storms in your life. Those storms are going to come a little bit later on. You don't discipline your children now it's going to be way worse later on down the road. And that's going to be a storm that comes in your life that you're not going to want to face when they become teenagers. You discipline your kids the way that the Bible tells you to discipline your kid. The Bible says if you, if you um, withhold correction from the child or if you spare the rod, you know, the, the world says spare the rod to spoil a child. The Bible says if you spare your rod, you hate your child. Amen. That's what the Bible says. But says, thou shalt beat him with the rod, and so shall you deliver his soul from hell. Amen. Biblical discipline. Now, we're not talking about beating and sending someone to the, to the hospital because you've broken their bones and you've you like inflicted serious injury upon them. That's not discipline. But discipline is, is disciplining someone with the rod in the, in the padded area of their body that God gave them for that purpose. Inflict a little bit of pain. And get them to, to realize the error of their way early on. So that later on in life, they don't have to face the big, serious storms in their life because they realize there's consequences to their actions. That when you do wrong, it's going to come back on you. When you sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. Every small seed that you sow is going to come back you know, tenfold, a hundredfold. I mean, you think about, we've got a bunch of fruit trees at my house and they all started from one little seed. You sow that one little seed in the ground, they grow up and they, they end up producing so much more, especially over the years, they keep producing and producing and producing. Well, all seeds work like that. And we gotta be, be very careful that we're sowing the right seeds because, hey, you sow the good seeds, you'll receive blessing. And it'll be good. You keep sowing that good seed and it'll return the blessing. Doubtless. 
But you sow those bad seeds, you, you sow the seeds of sin, same thing's going to happen. The same, same rules apply. And you're going to be reaping those storms from that sin for time to come. And it's going to be way worse than what you had put out there to begin with. It always comes back in an order of magnitude. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 25. Because as I mentioned, not all storms are preventable. Many of them are. And we need to get that right with ourselves to, to try to avoid the Irmas and the Harveys coming into our life because we just want to go off and sin. We want to disobey God. We want to head the other direction when God tells us to go this way, to go that way. We could avoid those storms. We could avoid that tempest. But not all storms are preventable. So what we need to do is we need to be prepared for the storm. We need to be ready. Always. Always be ready to go through a storm. I mean, look at all the chaos that's going on even right now with people who are not prepared for the storms. They're running out and getting water. They're running out and getting gas. They're running out, you know, and the stores are, you know, the shelves are cleared. And now it's costing them tons of money just to get some basic things that if you would have just already been living a prepared life, I mean, especially in those areas, I mean, you got to know, I mean, it's known for having storms and hurricanes and things like that. I believe fully that we all ought to be individually responsible for ourselves. You ought to be ready for storms in your life. And look, we don't live on the coast. But it's a wise thing to be ready for the power grid to go down, for you to lose your job at work, for you to go through any type of disaster or storm in your own personal life. Maybe you need a little bit of extra supply built up for those rough times. You know, even if it's not a, a, a physical, literal hurricane. This is just using wisdom. This is just being ready so that way you can minimize the impact of this storm on your life. Be ready for these things. Now, physically, of course, I was just bringing up physical examples. Having maybe a little bit of extra you know, emergency cash, having some extra food and drink and some things just, just put aside in the case of emergency. You have it. You don't have to worry about it. Have some gasoline, some fuel, whatever it is that you're going to need for various events that can happen in your life, it's wise to have those things. But also spiritually. We're in Matthew chapter 25. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, Then shall all the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. We need to be ready. And this is what this parable is talking about. You had ten virgins, five were ready, five were prepared, five were good to go, and five were foolish. You just compare the wise versus the foolish. In all these verses, they go back and forth. The wise ones did this, the foolish ones did this. The wise ones did this, foolish ones. The wise ones were prepared. The wise ones had oil. The wise ones were ready to go at a moment's notice. When the Lord comes, they're ready. The foolish ones, they weren't ready. Oh, wait, oh, it's time to go. Oh, hold on a second. I need to get, oh, hey, can I have some of your oil? They're like, no. Go get your own. Because if I give you some of mine, then neither of us might have enough. You need to go get your own. And then they finally get their stuff and they come back. Okay, now we're ready. Too late. Too late. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details on this and all the extra spiritual. There's a lot of spiritual applications we can make in this story. But I just want to focus on the fact that, I mean, this is showing people who are prepared versus not prepared. And that people who are not prepared lost out greatly. They had serious loss because they weren't ready. They didn't prepare themselves. They were not ready to go. 
Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Being prepared for a storm, everything starts off with having a good foundation. If you don't have your foundation right, nothing else is going to matter. It doesn't matter how elaborate you build upon that because it's going to be... Um, it's going to be able to ruin real quickly. We need a good foundation. Luke 6, verse number 46. <clears throat> verse number 46, the Bible reads, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? This is Jesus Christ speaking. He said, why are you calling me Lord, and you're not doing what I'm telling you to do? Because think about it, Lord means boss, Right? You're calling me the boss. You're calling me the Lord, and you're not doing what I'm telling you to do. What kind of boss is that? I, you know, basically saying, I don't believe you. You're calling me Lord. I don't believe you because you're not doing what I'm telling you to do. Verse number 47, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and, do, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. The best way to be prepared for a storm is to have the right foundation. Now, we know that Jesus Christ, of course, is the ultimate foundation, that he is the rock, and that everything starts with your own personal salvation being saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be your foundation. But we're talking to people who are already saved this morning that still need to have a good building and to be solid and to be prepared for the storms because storms come upon the saved and the unsaved. You need to not only, because think about it, getting saved has nothing to do with doing what Jesus told you to do. In this context, he's not talking about them being saved. He's talking about people doing what he tells them to do. He's saying that's when you're going to have a sure house. That's when you're going to have a real sure foundation. And that when all the problems come, you won't be moved. Your house won't break. Your house won't fall because you're not only hearing, you're doing. You're listening and applying that in your life. When you read the Bible, when you come to church, when you hear sermons preached, when you, when you hear what's going, what God is instructing you, you put it into action. The more you do that, the more you hear God and God's word and God's instructions and put them into action, that will keep you strong and solid when the tempest comes, when the storm comes, when the rivers come, when the, the overflowing floods come and beat against you, trying to knock you down, shake your faith. Because ultimately, what do storms do? They cause stress, fear, trouble. Now, I'm talking about not just literal storms, but, but, but storms in your life. When, when things that are really bad happen, what do they do? You lose a loved one. You get in a really bad fight with a, with a spouse. You, 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 know, you have serious family problems. You have serious medical problems. You, you know, wh whatever the case may be, they mess with you more on the inside than anything else. And what's going to happen is if you're not strong, they can wash you right out of church, wash you right out of serving God, wash you right out of doing the right thing because you've gotten scared, because you don't know why these things are happening, because you don't know what to do, and how could this be happening to me, and you're not ready. Your heart isn't, you're, you're not solid and strengthened enough inside to be able to continue to move forward. But when you've trained yourself and prepared yourself to be doing the right things, to be listening to God. One, you're going to be getting wisdom because the more, when God, when God opens up your eyes to thing in scripture, if he opens up your eyes to something, say, wow, I never saw that before. That's, that's neat. And it's something that applies to you. And then you just forget about it and you don't actually take that, what God's opened your eyes up about and apply, apply it to your life. 
God's not going to continue just revealing more and more to you. He's going to say, take care of what I'm showing you right now. Get this straight in your life. I'm going to see that you're listening to me, and then I'll keep giving you more wisdom and more knowledge. It builds on itself. But if he sees you're going to be a, you know, a hearer that doesn't, that's not interested in doing it and is not really has the heart to follow what God asks for you, he's not going to keep doing that for you, and you're not going to be prepared. But the more you, you apply God's word, he's going to strengthen you and give you more wisdom and knowledge to help you make the right decisions, to help you not be so not confident when the conflicts arise. When you know God's word, you know how to handle situations, whether it be a family situation or even a medical situation, you know, things that are going on, you're going to have a lot more wisdom to make the right choices because you've already been listening to God's instructions and you're going to God for your answers and you're relying on the Lord to lead you, even though you may not understand why is everything in turmoil right now. And look, going through a storm is not fun. No one ever claims that it's a good time to be going through these storms in life. But you can have peace when going through the storms, when you're relying on the Lord, when you're not allowing these outside circumstances to completely shake your faith or make you lose your faith because bad things have happened. We need to be strong and ready to go. We need to have that, founda that foundation already set and cemented in our hearts. Now, when storms hit, the goal is going to be during that time is to make it through, right? Other things are going to be going out the window because when you're faced with a serious storm, I mean, right now people are getting hit by hurricanes. They're in survival mode. They're not worried about going out and trimming the trees and doing, you know, yard work or anything else, any other chores that they have on their chore list. They're not even worried about going out to work. They're going, we got to make it through this. This is priority number one. We need to survive. And when serious storms come in your life, yeah, you're going to have to probably just, just, you know, other things are going to have to drop by the wayside temporarily to get through that storm and to deal with that storm. But I'll tell you what ought never to fall by the wayside is listening to God. We need to make sure that we keep that open. I mean, that, that should be more open than anything else. Think about how many people are probably praying to the Lord that are going through the floods and the hurricanes and the winds and everything else that's going on right now. It's probably way more people than ever normally in that area. And that's what storms ought to do. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we need to be brought low because we get too, too um, comfortable in our life and we need to be unsettled a little bit because Everything's going fine. Everything's going smooth. And then you start to forget God. And sometimes these storms come and it's a little bit of a reminder for you. But don't let that take you the other direction and just say, forget God then. Everything was going good. Why, you know, and have the spoiled brat type of an attitude. Well, why should, you know, why has all this stuff happened to happen to me now? I thought everything was going good. Well, forget all this. Think about Job. Job was in survival mode. Job went through a serious storm in his life. And that was one that he did not bring on himself. He did not cause that storm. He was, he was a perfect man. Now, not sinless, but he was, you know, he was the, the most righteous man upon the earth at that time. He didn't bring that storm on him. Satan brought that storm on him. Satan attacked him. Why? Because he was living righteously. Because he was doing what was right and he was trying to bring him down. And um, even after he lost all of his possessions, everything he owned, brought down to nothing in, a, in one day. The Bible says in Job 1.22, in all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. He didn't sin against God. He maintained his faith. He maintained his integrity. He maintained, say, so you know what? Lord's given, the Lord's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, I came into this world naked. I'm going to leave naked. And it's fine by me. God doesn't owe me anything. He's given me life. He's given his son to pay for my sins. God doesn't owe me anything. So I'm not going to charge God foolishly when bad things come my way. And blame God for everything. But Job had to enter a state of survival mode. Now, it's a lot easier 
to have that, that strong outlook when everything is going well, right? But this is when you get tested is when you go through the hard times. And Job was tested. He wasn't thinking about much else. He was sad. He was sorrowful. And he was questioning, what, you know, still why, you know, why these things are happening. He wasn't charging and blaming God, but he was still saying, you know, I don't, I don't understand why it's happening. On top of that, he has friends saying, you're in sin. You know, just tell us what you did wrong. We know we must have done something wicked because none of this stuff would have happened if you didn't. And, and just continually just railing on him. And these are supposed to be his friends that came to help him out and to support him when he's, when he's going through our time. And they're just saying, what'd you do, Job? We know you must have done something wrong. Come on, spill the beans, Job. What are you doing? I didn't do anything. He went through a lot. <clears throat> we need to try to prevent multiple storms from happening by staying true to the Lord. It probably could have got even worse for Job had he gone the wrong direction. But he stayed true. And he made it through that, uh, that hard time. And we need to not forget to come back out of survival mode also. One thing about going into survival mode, you kind of put a lot of things off on the, on the side, I mean, on the back burner, so to speak. But don't forget to come back out of that. You know, unfortunately, oftentimes, you know, bad things can happen. That could... Um, you know, get you out of church because, you know, maybe someone's in the hospital going through really, you know, and you're just, you're just, you got to deal with that. You know, you got to care for somebody and you're just, you're out. You're out of everything for legitimate reasons. Don't then, when that starts to get settled and that storm starts to pass, just forget about coming back to church and coming back and, you know, and getting back into a good routine. We need to get back into the swing of things. Don't let the storm knock you out. When you make it through Job 38, verse number three, the Bible says, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. This is when God starts to answer Job. He's saying, get up, gird up your loins like a man and answer me. And of course, he goes through a whole bunch of questions that Job can't answer. Again, humbling Job, but it, you know, God's telling him, okay, look, you've, you've had your time to grieve. You've had your time. Now get up. Gird up your loins, be a man, and, and get back in this thing. And then after a few chapters, you know, everything ends, and he's saying, okay, now, Job, you need, you know, you need to make a sacrifice for your friends here because they, what they're saying is wrong. It's not acceptable in my sight. And, and Job gets right, and then God ends up blessing him. Storms are trials. There could be trials of your faith. Job said in the midst of all of this stuff, and in Chapter 23, verse 10, he said, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He knew he was going through a trial. And we need to remember that when we have storms in our life, hey, this is a trial. And I need to maintain my faith and my integrity and stay true to God. Chapter 42, verse 12 says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. God blessed them at the end of everything. And we need to have faith that when we're going through our trials, especially when they're trials that we didn't bring on ourselves, right? I mean, the ones we bring on ourselves, we bring that on ourselves. But when we go through the, the tempests, the storms, that they're not our fault, and you get through those, right? God will bless you in the end. God will bless you in the end. You maintain your faith. You maintain your integrity like Job did. He blessed him. He blessed him double. He lost his children. He had 10 more children. He lost all of his stuff. He got twice as much stuff. God blessed him in the end. Turn if you to Mark chapter 4. We're almost done. Mark chapter 4. When the storms come, we need to have the solid foundation. When the storms come, we need to remember not to be fearful, but to have faith. Not to get scared. The unknown brings fear for the vast majority of people, not knowing what's going on. Fear is going to bring you, lead you to making really bad choices, really bad decisions 
are, are made in a snap decision when you're afraid and don't know what's going on. It happens all the time. Areas that you're not used to, you're out of your normal routine, Something is, some storm is blown in and you're like, oh man, I wasn't ready for this, now I don't know what to do and I need to make some kind of decision and, and, and I'm afraid, well, I don't, you know, what, what am I supposed to do here? It's, it's one thing to not have all of the answers, but it's another thing to be afraid. No one has all the answers. You're never going to have all of the answers, but don't make decisions based off of fear. Unless it's the fear of the Lord. <laughs> that, that would be the right decision. But if it's any other fear of what anyone else is going to do, fear of, you know, I mean, when, think about the, the first time that the apostles or disciples were being arrested for preaching on Jesus. It's a situation they'd never faced before, right? It's a very fearful situation that they could be placed into. Oh man, I'm arrested. I'm being beat up. I don't know what to do. They're telling me not to do this. And if they would have just been afraid, they could have been like, oh, well, I just want this to stop and this is how I get it to stop because this is what, how they're telling me I need to get it to stop. So I'm just, okay, I I'll, I'll just won't say anything then. I'll just agree with them and, and, just, and that'll be it. That would have been the wrong decision to make. It would be based off of fear. Look at Mark chapter 4. We're going to see the story that we saw the, alluded to in Jonah where Jesus was now asleep in the ship. Mark chapter 4, verse number 37, the Bible reads, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. The water is filling up the boat. I mean, the boat's getting totally full of water in this storm. But look at what it says in verse 38. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say, And a master, carest thou not that we perish? So in the midst of this storm, Jesus Christ was asleep. Now, first of all, they, they ask him, you know, don't you care that we're going to die? Of course Jesus cared. Jesus cared about them, but Jesus knew they weren't going to die, which is why he wasn't afraid. They're out. They're serving God. They're doing the work of the Lord. Jesus knows he's doing what's right. The people he's with were doing what's right, but they, didn't, they lacked a level of faith. Jesus was with them. They truly had nothing to fear. They really didn't. They had no reason to fear when Jesus is with them. But the fleshly side of them is looking around them and looking at the wind and looking at the storm and looking at the water, and they were afraid. And they were so much afraid, they're, they're starting to freak out and stress out, going, what are you... We've got this work going on. We're about to die, and you're down here asleep. Jesus, come on, help us out. This was their attitude. Don't you even, don't you even care? We're about to die. Of course he cared, but he knew better. Jesus knew. When we don't understand what's going on, it's easy to get scared, and it's easy to make bad assumptions. When bad things happen in your life, it's easy to say, well, God doesn't care about me. Yes, he does. You, you, you've misplaced intent. You've misplaced what's going on. And you are not understanding it properly. It's not because God doesn't care about you. There's other reasons. They were going through a storm. Jesus wasn't worried about it. He was asleep because he knew he didn't have to worry about it. They went to him, which was still good. Go to Jesus. Hey, you're in a storm. You got problems. Go to Jesus. Go to him, but don't assume that he doesn't care, because he absolutely cares. If Jesus is with you, what do you have to fear in the midst of your storms? Again, this goes back to why is the storm there in the first place? If the storm's there because you're not with Jesus, well, maybe there's a little bit more to fear. You need to go back and, and, and go, hey, I'm sorry. You know, repent of your wickedness. Get Jesus back with you. And I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm just talking about your walk with God. Go back and, and walk with Jesus. And if you, if, you have, if you are walking with him, you've got nothing to fear. 
Even when the bad times come, you don't need to fear. Now, I'm not saying it's pleasant, but you don't have to fear. You can have the peace that Jesus had without, when, you, when you don't have the fear, when you could be completely reliant upon the Lord. Look at verse number 39. It says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. God made it all go away. Made it all stop. They went to him, and he made it stop. Verse number 40. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey him? But he asked them, he said, why, why are you afraid? How is it that you have, he said, you have no faith? They weren't trusting completely in, I mean, Jesus was with them and they weren't trusting that he was going to make it okay. You're doing right by God. You're winning God's will. Jesus is with you. Have the faith to know that, hey, he's with me. So whatever happens, hey, if, I, if I'm in God's will, whatever happens, I'm not going to be afraid of it. I mean, even if it means being martyred like Stephen in Acts chapter 7, and he, you know, he's just doing what God told him to do. But you know what? He wasn't afraid. When they picked up stones to stone him, he didn't fear. He lifted up his eyes. Like, oh. He saw heaven open up. He didn't fear. Now, that's what God had for him, but you know what? He went through that storm. I guarantee you he is blessed beyond measure. And those are the blessings that you can look forward to, but you have to have the faith to know that they're even there. Those blessings are real. And we'll realize them you know, when Jesus comes back, we'll see, we'll see what those blessings really are. You won't have to have that faith anymore. We have faith now because we don't see him. You're going to see him and in, in, in have him. Then you realize, oh, this, is, <laughs> this is what I was living for. No reason to fear. Look at the uh, last place of turn, Matthew 14. Last place, Matthew 14. Storms will come. They come and they go. It's not from climate change. <laughs> I mean, Man-made climate change in your own life, maybe. You bring your own sin, <laughs> cause the storms, but these storms are going to come, and they're going to come with varying degrees of severity. People have always faced storms in their life, and they always will. As long as we have these sinful bodies, we're going to be facing storms from one end or another. But you need to be prepared. You need to be ready for them. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse number 24. The Bible reads, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. So again, they're afraid. They see this thing. They, they think it's just some spirit walking on the water, and, and it scared them. Verse 27, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. I love this story. Look at verse number 29. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, that's a lot of faith. He had faith enough to step over the side of the boat because Jesus said to come. If Jesus commands, he says, you come to me, Peter had enough faith to go, okay, I will. Even though normally knowing he'd go <laughs> sink right into that water. But not if Jesus said to do it, then you, it doesn't matter what your fleshly mind thinks, you just can do it and trust that it's going to be okay. Peter got out of that boat, trusting it's going to be okay. And it was. Can you imagine that first step? Man, how cool is that? There's, there's Jesus. He's going to Jesus. This is awesome, right? Exhilarating, I'm sure. And other people watching him going like, wow, 
I wish I would have. <laughs> I wish I would have called on Jesus to have him bid me to come to him. And uh, he's walking on the water. Go, Jesus. But look at verse number thirty. It says, "But when he saw the wind boisterous, the wind picks up, storm picks up. He was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me.' It's, he got scared." The wind picks up, the waves, are, you know, the waves are probably crashing around and going, oh man, I don't know what to do. And he gets scared. Even though Jesus just said to come unto him. And he was already walking on the water. We still get scared. Now look, I'm not downing Peter for this because I'm not saying that I would have even had the faith to do what, you know, to get out of the boat in the first place. Would to God that I would have. And that's one of the reasons I think the story's in here. So we could all have that, that, that mentality and the thought of, hey, you know, I would get out of the boat. I, I would go to Jesus. You know, whatever he says, I'm going to just trust in what he says. And all these stories are here for our admonition. We could listen and learn from these things and build and strengthen ourselves and say, wow, look what Peter is able to do. He got scared and started to sink. We need to make sure that we don't get fearful when the storms come, when the wind blows, when things look scary. Don't get scared. If you're walking towards Jesus, you have no reason to be scared. If he's called unto you, come to me, and you're listening to him, you're obeying him, no reason to be fearful whatsoever. None. But as soon as he called on Jesus, just like when he was asleep in the boat, what they do? They came to Jesus, they called on, they woke him up, they, everything was just fine. Storm died down, no more threat of, of dying at all, no more threat of, of the boat being sunk. Soon as Peter starts to get a little bit afraid, he starts to sink a little bit in the water. Lord, save me. Verse 31, and immediately, no hesitation, you call on Jesus Christ, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? He didn't say he had no faith, he said he had little faith. That's what a little faith can do get you to step out of the boat and walk on water. Jesus said if you had you know, faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you could remove mountains. There's are great things that happen with just a little bit of faith. Verse 32, and when they were coming into the ship, the wind ceased. And of course, when Jesus was with everyone, everything's just fine. Storms are going to come. Guaranteed. They come, you've probably already been through a whole bunch of them. You need to be ready for them up here and in here. Know that they're going to come. But be steadfast in your obedience unto the Lord and, and, and your faith to God, knowing that whatever comes your way, the unforeseen things that are scary, being put in new situations that you never thought would have happened. You will get through them. You may be being tried like Job was, but have the same mentality Job has that say, you know what, when I'm tried, I'm going to come through like gold. Why? Because he was still reliant on the Lord. He still was clinging to God's word. He still had the faith and trusted that, hey, God is good. God is good and God loves you. And when you're going through hard times, for the first thing I would do is analyze yourself, make sure you didn't bring the storm on yourself and get that right, because that can help bring an end, a quicker end to the storm. But then too, you know, if it's you, nothing too blaring and you say, well, I'm just going to keep doing what's right because God's with me and I have no reason to be afraid. And those two things, you, 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 get, through, you get through anything. It's far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great advice and wisdom and these great stories that we have from other men that have gone through some very difficult times and faced storms in their life. God, I pray that you would please help us to be prepared to, to lay that foundation of your word to rely on, on Jesus and to um, just to not only hear what you have to tell us, but to do it, to, to apply it to our lives. Lord, to, to really... Uh, respect your instructions and, and 
apply them to our life, that we would be able to make it through whatever comes our way. God, we, we do pray for those that are, uh, that are walking in your will and that, and that you're not bringing judgment upon them, but that you would um, help them to get through this, help them to survive the difficult storms, the literal storms that they're facing, dear Lord, and uh, that you would protect them. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.